So what does building a brand and politics have in common? Well, in my opinion, building a brand in the political arena is like doing so in a pressure cooker. That's why I'm so excited to talk to today's guest. Welcome to the Brand Gravity Show. I am your host, psychology-driven brand strategist, Kay Putnam. And today I'm talking with Matt Creighton. Matt is the founder of Publitics. He provides counsel to campaigns at the local, state, and national levels, as well as to clients in private and public sectors. Most recently, Matt worked on special projects during the 2020 presidential campaign, including having helped create President Joe Biden's We Just Did hat. He's currently an adjunct professor in Centenary University's business department, teaching in their first of its kind social media program. Prior to funding Publitics, Matt worked at Farley Dickinson University's Public Mind Poll and later taught freshman seminar for political science students and in the law of liberal arts program as an adjunct professor. Let's get into the conversation. All right, Matt, thank you so much for being on the show. I am so excited for our conversation. You are not our typical guest, I will say, because of your particular expertise. Can you let us know who you work with and what you do for them? Sure, absolutely. So I am the founder and principal at a full service public affairs, public relations and political consulting firm. So so we do a lot of political work and a lot of political adjacent work in addition to corporate and nonprofit work. But the, the, the political arena is where we got our start and still very much where we do a, a ton of a ton of work. What inspired you to get into politics and campaign counseling? Oh man, that's a funny, that's a funny story. So I actually, this, this is sort of a very millennial kind of roundabout way of, of arriving at, at, at my final sort of destination. Well, maybe not final destination for a career, but at the career I'm in currently. So I, I actually went to college to become a teacher, right? Secondary education, wanted to be a history teacher. So I went through the whole thing, undergrad, did my master's in education. And then, you know, 2008 hit graduated in 2010 with my bachelor's and there were no jobs at, at that time. So it was very competitive and uh, a ton of teaching positions were cut. I mean, t history teachers were like a dime a dozen. So I was sitting, sitting here af as I was completing my master's kind of thinking, uh oh, what am I going to do with my life? So while I was doing my master's degree, I had the benefit of doing a, a graduate assistantship with a public polling institute at the university I was at, the public mind poll at Fairleigh Dickinson University. And I had always been interested in politics and, and kept up to date, you know, avid consumer of, of news, but I had never really done any work volunteering on campaigns, but I've always voted and you know done the very bare minimum. But that was my first exposure to a, a deeper sort of experience with politics. I thought it was really interesting. So while I was there, um, you, you kind of got, got a sense of how to take the pulse of the public, understand how people are thinking about different policies and politicians. And I was like, oh, this is, this is pretty interesting. Fast forward a little bit, graduated from, you know, finished up grad school. And then did what a lot of other, again, millennials did and took the first job that I could, which was not in politics. Actually, it was in fundraising for that same university. So, uh, you know, did, did that whole thing, did the cold calling, which was a whole lot of fun, as you can imagine, calling people who have student loans, asking them for more money. And then, you know, you get some choice, choice words back on the phone. So didn't love that. So while I was doing that, I thought, well, you know what, why don't I just try this out? you know, try, try to do some like political consulting. At that point, this was like completely naive, had no idea what I was doing other than I thought, all right, let's give it a shot. So, uh, you know, formed the LLC and started poking around for clients. I know this is kind of like a really roundabout way of getting here, but, but it's, it is, it is sort of a funny story. So long story short, I found a couple of clients. I, I, my strategy was to find at least one campaign that was going to be like a total loser. Like I had, it was, I was like, if, if I go to a campaign that's sort of on one of the big lists, like, you know, they're, it's a competitive district or they're slated to win, they're never going to hire me to do anything meaningful, at least, or, or, you know, I'll be fetching coffee and all that stuff. Like, I don't really want to do that. So I was fortunate enough to, you know, run into a couple of campaigns, one for con congressional campaign, one local campaign, the congressional campaign. I was thinking too, like, what would they trust me to do with absolutely zero experience other than my graduate assistantship? at the public mind poll. And I was like, well, I'm young 
And social media sort of became the big buzz thing, buzzword in politics in 2008 during the first Obama campaign and then more so in, in 2012. So it's like, I'm going to be a digital strategist. So I was like, I'll do your social media. And they were like, great. You seem young. You know what you're talking about. So I figured it out on the fly. Ended up losing that one campaign, but the local campaign, we actually won and the ball kind of kept rolling. And, uh, and you know, the business has been growing ever since. Since then, we've done uh, races from, you know, local on up to federal national races. So it's been a really interesting journey, but that's kind of how I got into politics. It started with an interest and then kind of developed out of necessity, I, I would say. Yeah, amazing. As a fellow millennial who graduated in 2008, I relate a lot with with the journey that got you to where you're going. It's how I found myself in online business. I love this so much and I wanted to have this conversation because I feel like political marketing is personal branding on steroids. You have this like very hot button topics some of the times that people choose to go there. I would love to hear a little bit about your process. So like when you start working with a new human, a new candidate, what are some of the things that you're learning about them in the beginning to start to build their strategy? Yeah, that, that is a really good question. So I, I think sometimes the perception of, of politics and politicians is that they, they come as these sort of like pre-packaged goods, right? They kind of like just pop out of a Xerox machine somewhere and and there they are. That's that's what it is. That's what the brand is. But, you know, this may be a little surprising to, to some people, but they are real human beings ultimately, and everyone has their own story. So that's really where we start is personal background. Like, how did you come to this point? So very much like, you know, what we just spoke about my background and coming to politics and, and working in this field. That's what we look at for our political clients is we start to dig into that personal story, we try to figure out, okay, like, what is it that is special about this person? What, what about their experiences would inform how they approach policy, how, how they would approach a campaign and, and serving, serving the voting public. So, so that's really where we start is kind of digging into that and figuring out, okay, like, you know, did this person, you know, I don't, are, are they a recent immigrant? And like, do they have a really great like story about, you know, rags to riches? Or, or do they have a really great story about overcoming adversity? Or mm -hmm. is there some other thing, or they were an activist in, in some some way or another? So those, th that's really where we start. And then you try to figure out what it is in that moment, what elements of that story are going to resonate most with your audience, right? So every electorate is a little, a little bit different and partisan composition. And, and then also, as you noted, you're dealing with at times, some very highly emotional topics and, and subject matter, which 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 is tough, right? So you're kind of tapping into sort of a pre-existing thing. So the I guess the big principle that we kind of bring to political branding and like really assessing like what the personal brand and the narrative and the story is going to be is and, and then assembling the parts, right? There there are all these raw materials, and it's kind of like assembling them into a coherent thing. That, that you can communicate to voters. But I would say the big principle is like, we really think about where do we need to meet people? And then what, where, what areas do we need to lead people to, right? And, and I yeah. think that's the biggest question is like, are we trying to just meet people where they're at and give voice to the things that they're already feeling? Or do we need to take a certain segment of the electorate, you know, 51%, for example, like if you're, you know, in a head to head race, and do we need to move them from point A to point B on a particular issue? Because that's, that's the only way you're going to win. So I think those are those are the uh, the big pieces of how we approach, you know, building a narrative, essentially. Mm, this is fascinating. I would love to dive into the controversial or hot button topics a bit, because I feel like as entrepreneurs, a lot of the online entrepreneurs that listen or that I work with, we almost have the luxury of avoiding that conversation of being like, oh, that's politics or that's religion. I'm not going to go there. But since you've been working with politicians, I'm sure you have a ton of experience navigating the communication strategy around some of those. Can you give us some pointers as people who perhaps avoid the hard conversations too often? Sure. Ab absolutely. We, we call those the Thanksgiving table issues, right? Like the, the stuff that, that everyone tells you not to talk about at Thanksgiving. Like, don't bring that up in front of Uncle John. He's going to freak out if you say, say the wrong thing. So th that's a really good question. So I think, and, and, and an important one too, in, in that I, I think when you look at entrepreneurs, you know, either in the startup space or in some other space, and then also larger business, larger enterprise, there's an increasing consumer expectation that 
leaders, public figures are going to weigh in on, on these issues. So yeah. there's not a whole lot of room left on the sidelines anymore, unfortunately. Now, that's not to say that you need to weigh in on every single issue or swing at every pitch, to use a baseball analogy. The most important thing is like understanding what your values are as an entrepreneur, a public figure, leader, brand, whatever it is, like understand what those values are, really like define those things. And then you can kind of look through that lens to define how you talk about some of these hot button topics. Also like understanding your audience too. I mean, this is one thing that I, I think is becoming increasingly complicated for, for a lot of brands. It's like if you're, you have multiple audiences, right? You have your consumers, the people are going to be, you know, using your services or buying your products. And then you have, you know, people that you need to recruit to work with you, you know, and at times there can be a lot of tension between those two things because you, it's a big, diverse, broad country, a lot of different yeah. opinions on different things, even around our own Thanksgiving tables. Right. And I think in that sense, you know, understanding which audiences you need to communicate with are is is an extraordinarily important thing too in deciding how to talk about those issues and then and then you can start to get into the specifics of of those issues and the framing of those issues because it does make a big difference in like you could be talking about the same thing and really saying the same thing about an issue but the framing if it's just slightly different can make a huge difference in how people perceive ultimately what you're saying mm, yes what are some of the strategies that you use to move people who aren't convinced yet that 50, that proverbial 51% that you mentioned? So like when you're trying to earn the hearts and minds of people who don't already believe what you believe, and maybe that's not the right phrasing, but how are you, how are you leading the market through your strategies? That That's a really good question too. So when you're talking about like in the in the strict political context, right? You're running a race. You're really not even talking about 51% of people. You're talking actually about a very small percentage of people who are genuinely persuadable to a, a particular viewpoint. So yeah. maybe yeah, five, six yeah. percent, seven percent if you're lucky. And that, especially in general elections, right, where you have one party versus another party, it's a little bit different when you have, you know, like a primary election where you have like a mm -hmm. you know Democrat versus Democrat or Republican versus Republican, there's a lot more room for persuasion there, because you're not as a voter, viewing through that lens, like, you know, this is my team, and, and they are the other team. And you know, this is who I vote for. And yeah. then you have, again, that very tiny portion in the middle. But I, I think it depends on on a number of factors, like how you actually move move people to one from one position to another. I, I think, like if you're talking, so it's becoming harder to do that because people are becoming way more entrenched in in their viewpoints on various issues, and you and you see it across across the political spectrum, for better or for worse, ultimately. But I think that you know there are different different techniques, like mass media in general is useful for name ID. So like boosting that just like brand familiarity ultimately with whoever it is. And then what you have to do, right? Because, because if people don't know who you are, then you're just a generic, whatever, generic Democrat, generic Republic. And then that doesn't really work for anyone. So, so there's that piece of it, but like truly getting into like difficult issues and, and moving people along is, you know, takes a lot more intensive outreach and communication. So oftentimes you're even talking about like door to door, like having individual one to one conversations where you are relaying a personal experience, right? Like, so you kind of find that common ground initially, and then, and then you build upon that common ground to say, well, see, now here's where we diverge on this issue, but really we're not so different, are we? So maybe we can talk about it and have a, a deeper conversation and really understand like what it is that's, that's preventing you from getting from point A to point B. So yeah. it's about getting people to take smaller steps along the way, because again, like people are getting more and more entrenched in their views. They end up in these like filter bubbles too, which is really tough mm -hmm. to overcome. So you're talking about like cable news, right? So like particular, I'm not going to, you know, call out any particular channels, but there's some that, that have a very, very strong specific viewpoint and yeah. oftentimes aren't necessarily even sharing the truth necessarily. And there were some lawsuits about that recently, but the on, on social, on social media too, right? The algorithms kind of, they're self-reinforcing. So if you start to like, or interact with one piece of content, you're just going to see more and more and more of that. And it becomes harder than to see something outside of that viewpoint. So, so it's kind of like breaking through those filter bubbles, finding that common ground with people, and then you can kind of move them along 
along the way. I mean, you may not even get all the way there, but you may get to a point where it's the interactions or thinking about a particular issue isn't driven by like pure anger or, mm. or whatever fear, which is often another emotion that people bring to these things sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. This is wild because there are so many parallels between the way that you're approaching uh, supporting politicians and the way that entrepreneurs work. And just to call some of them out for, for the people listening, because this is just so dang relevant. Like before you're known as a brand, as you know, for whatever service you're creating, you're just another copywriter. You're just another artist. You're just another insert vocation here. And the act of building a brand gives you the opportunity to elevate beyond that, that commodity level. So I'm hearing that when you're trying to move somebody, one of the most effective ways is to have that one-on-one -on -one conversation and to be able to speak directly to the human that you're talking to instead of just these mass messages. So yeah, fantastic parallels between my world and your world. And I'm just loving hearing about this. Are you still working a lot in the digital space? Is that your primary communication platform? It, yeah, it, it's, it's a big part of it, right? So, wow. so we, we approach everything as sort of a multi, you know, omni-channel campaign. So whether that's television advertising, digital or direct mail, and then out of home is, is becoming an increasingly large piece of the, of the puzzle where, where you can kind of reach people in, in a way that's slightly less noisy than, than these other areas. So, yeah. um, to answer your question, yes, digital has to be, because we spend so much time on our, our screens, like you cannot afford to forsake that space. You can't cede that to, to your competition purely and, and just rely on, on cable television or broadcast television ads, earned media or, or direct mail though. I will say like all of those things together, it's about finding the right mix for us. So it typically it, it I mean, again, overall budgets, right? So like if you have a smaller budget campaign, you know, I'm talking like sub million dollars in an expensive media market, you're not going to do broadcast TV. It's just not going to happen yeah. because you can spend a million dollars in a matter of like a week on broadcast in like a New York media market, for example. So so you, you find the mix that works for, for the voters that you're trying to reach. Again, like districts, too, like different districts or jurisdictions, they all have like different mixes of voters too. Like some are younger, some are a little bit older. Yeah. So it's like, where are people spending their time? And, and that's that's kind of what we what we think about. So it's different on almost every campaign. Do you have any favorite examples of campaigns that have had outsized or unexpected return on the energy or investment that you put in? That's a good question. Unexpected or outsized impact is is it is a tough one again because in, in you know in the political sphere right now you're you're talking about like moving very small portions of the electorate. So for example, in in the last presidential election, and in the one before that in 2016, really what you're talking about are 70,000 voters nationwide. That's it. It's wild. That's that's the difference. Wild. That is the difference across your swing states. And that's, you know, quirk of, of this electoral college situation that we have here. So then you kind of look at like the, the question of like, what was different between 2016 and, and 2017? Um, I think like there was a sort of brand image that was much different between like a Hillary Clinton and, and a Joe Biden, for example, mm -hmm. that made things work out. And, and again, you're talking about fractions of points. So you're not even talking about winning in certain areas, like especially in the presidential, you're talking about losing by less. So like in, in the middle of like rural Pennsylvania, you're not really talking about winning those areas. You're talking about losing by three points less than, than you would have in 2016. That combined then with a big win in like the Pittsburgh, I'm just using Pennsylvania as an example, because mm -hmm. this is like, I mean, because it's, again, you have those two like Philly and, and Pittsburgh and then the rest of the state, well, really in the Philly suburbs and all of that whole area. But in the middle, again, in the, in the middle of, of Pennsylvania, you're not looking at winning there, but you're looking at running up the numbers in the places that you're strong and then losing by just a little bit less. So it's not necessarily like where you would even see, and it's just getting tighter and tighter and tighter. Whereas if you go back to the Obama campaign, 2008, he won in all sorts of places that I don't think you would ever conceive of winning as a Democrat right now, not ever, but it's, it's getting tougher, right? So like, you know, you won in Ohio, I believe you won North Carolina, right? So like, those are areas mm -hmm. that you wouldn't expect and haven't, haven't been especially fruitful for, for Democrats. So I would say, you know, it's, it's hard to define what would be outsized impact. Again, you see it in the primaries a little bit more where you are able to develop a brand and you're not necessarily like if everyone's sort of equally resourced in, in those campaigns, then 
you actually see like a movement from one one thing to the other depending upon depending upon the 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 electorate in in those areas so uh, so it's 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 a tough thing back to your earlier point though about defining yourself as yeah. as a brand or an entrepreneur so i will say like that's a huge thing is one of the most dangerous things is to be a blank canvas because if you don't quickly define yourself someone else will do it for you and it's not going to be on the terms that you want it to be on unfortunately so again going back to 2012 when obama was was running against mitt romney mitt romney was i mean he was like relatively well known but kind of a blank canvas yeah and they just they framed him in 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 such a way that was you know made made it seem made him seem out of touch with regular everyday americans so i would say like they did a fantastic job at defining the competition there whereas like if you look at like a you know donald trump for example, now, like everyone kind of knows who he is and opinions of him are by and large baked in, like, that's it. Yeah. Like there's no additional movement or very little additional movement at, at this point. So it's like a totally different ball game where it's like running against a totally blank canvas, like someone that's relatively well-known, but you don't have a lot of experience with day to day is it's a dangerous thing to be the blank canvas in that, in that scenario. Is the game in politics and political marketing, is it largely driven by frequency then where you're just, you're trying to saturate the communication channels with your narrative or what is like the overarching goal when you set out to create a new campaign? That, that's a really good question too, because we, we have to think a lot about this because the, I, I think the approach generally is we have to achieve saturation, which is true. Like you yeah. do have to repeatedly hit people with the message before it sinks in, especially if you're not, again, someone who has that like pre baked in kind of brand, mm -hmm. you know, you're not a TV, TV personality. You're not like someone that people have that daily experience with or, or weekly experience with. So in that sense, I think you are looking at, at saturation. The other problem is though, that everyone else is doing that too. So right. you end up in a space where I'm sure you've experienced it. I'm not sure where, where you're based out of, but I'm sure you've, you've seen the deluge of commercials and busy election years, the midterms yeah. and presidential cycles, where it's just one commercial after the other, after the other. Now, I think part of it is like, do you really want to find out what happens if you don't do that? Like if you don't participate in that mm. situation. And I think the answer for now is no, you don't. But that being said, with all of that saturation, you have to figure out then what the timing of your communication is going to be. So are you going to try to go a little bit early? And it's all resource dependent too. Like if you yeah. raise, you know, a lot, you can do a lot more, right? You can start earlier. You can start to define yourself a little bit more effectively early on. But the second piece is then going back to that brand that personal brand. it's like what is your story then like what are, what are you yeah. going to tell people so i think like again people have this sense of like politician like the really the people have this sense of politicians it's like guy in a suit pops out of his xerox machine and, and this is who it is right this caricature of of politicians and people don't like politicians like in in that sense right so if you ask people like do you like congress vast majority of americans say no I don't, I don't approve of the way Congress and that number fluctuates, you know, month to month, year to year, but as a whole, they're like, oh, Congress, no good. But if you ask people, do you like your member of Congress? The answer is different. Most of the time yeah. it's yeah, actually I do. And what, when, what accounts for that difference? So Congress, bunch of guys in suits that you pop out of a Xerox, Xerox machine, your member of Congress though, has a story. Yeah. If they've done their job the right way, right? They have a story. So, so, the, so that's a real, so the really effective political communication does tie in again, that, that narrative, that the personal narrative to the policy points that, that you want to run on. And, and then you have to figure out a creative way to break through all of the, all of the noise that's happening. Because again, you are ultimately going to end up being in a very, very noisy communication environment. It's not a question of if it's going to be a when, like, does it mm -hmm. happen? primarily in September, October, I mean, does it start as early as August? And then, and then you have to figure out how to build a program around that. But I, I think it's about creatively uh, presenting those brand attributes. So do you use humor, for example? Like, is that something that you can do and you can pull off with your candidate? Uh, not everyone can pull off humor and that's okay. Do you do inspirational sort of, you know, do you do an inspirational kind of message? Do you talk about struggle? Do you talk, I mean, so it, it all kind of depends. Do you talk about being tough or whatever yeah. attribute it is? And then how do you present that in a way that's going to be like, oh, well, 
that's interesting. I've never seen that before. That's a little surprising, a little out of the ordinary. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. I deal a lot with brand archetypes in, in my business, and I think they have such a direct application in, I mean, anywhere where there's personal brands and strong personalities, but per maybe particularly in politics, because there's those those patterns that we hear in story and in literature and basically everywhere that repeat themselves again and again, like it's the regs to riches or there's a bunch of them, but it's so interesting that politicians are using those. I don't want to say trope because I feel like trope has that negative connotation, but the, those patterns, those psychological patterns that people relate with on an emotional level. Um, oh, hundred percent. Yeah. yeah. I mean, there's some right. element of surprise, you know, being surprised yeah. about who, who you're dealing with again, because you have this picture of like what a politician is like, if you close your eyes right now and said, okay, like picture a politician, you'd probably just be some generic person. And the, and the, the interesting thing is like, sometimes like you're, you don't have an especially interesting story or background, but you're just a very competent person. Mm. And that that's actually a tough sell. Sometimes it's just like being competent is, is a tough sell. Why which do you is think that is? A, that's so interesting. Because it's not, it's not exciting. It's not surprising. It doesn't make people angry. It doesn't, you know, push people to action. It's not polarizing. It just is, you know, you're just yeah, like do your job and, and it's, it's very unnoticeable. <laughs> so like, you can also be confident though and have like a good story. So like everyone's got a story. You just have to find it. But like on, on the surface, like if you're just kind of scratching the surface, it's sometimes it's really tough to just sell pure confidence, unfortunately. I mean, there are ways to present it again, but it's, yeah. it, it's definitely an interesting, interesting thing. What's your strategy when you have a candidate that you know is going to have something controversial about them or like problematic about them? That's a good question. There are two ways that this normally goes. So one is like how people sort of like communicate with their lawyers and their doctors, right? You know, how many donuts do you eat a week? Oh, not that many it's fine or whatever. <laughs> in reality, like, you know, I'm eating like three boxes of donuts a, a day. So like you try to figure out what it is you know, if there are any skeletons in the closet, anything that could go wrong. And sometimes people will tell you and, and they're very honest and they say, okay, I had this problem or this problem or, or whatever it was. And then other times you find out you get half the story maybe, or none of the story. And then, and then you have to figure out like what to do from there. So from our perspective, like as a firm, there are certain things that we will not defend period. Mm -hmm. Like, yeah. <laughs> if there is any accusation of, of like profound impropriety, we will evaluate as, as a firm or leadership team, my partner and I, whether or not we even get into that mm -hmm. because I, I just like, it's not up to me. So like what I usually say is like, there are PR problems and then there are problem problems, right? So the PR problems are things that you've said that maybe didn't come off the right way, but were well-intentioned or, you know, things that you've done in the past that were genuine mix-ups, like things that like mm -hmm. actually were not a big deal, but you know, it kind of turned into a big deal or, or it was yeah. spun in a certain way. So like, we'll defend that to the end of the end of the earth. No problem yeah. with that. On the other stuff, we really do have to take a good hard look and say like, okay, like did this person do it particularly in like workplace harassment, sexual mm -hmm. harassment, any of that stuff, like we just don't do it. Like, even if there's a whiff of it, I, you know, we'll say like, go talk to, someone else get a lawyer like i'm sorry but like we can't can't do it mm -hmm. there are rare cases where things are actually made up and you get a pretty good gut feeling though doing this long enough like when they're telling you the truth and when they're not so you do become a little <laughs> bit of a human lie detector of like okay this is only half the story but i think like the biggest thing like when when we're talking about like how do you defend against something that is potentially damaging or toxic you know, from a messaging perspective is, is third party validation is a big piece of it. So like finding yeah. validators outside who will help reinforce whatever weak points you may have or wherever the opposition is trying to hit you on. So it's, it's not even cra like crisis stuff sometimes, but like just basic, like pre conceived notions about per mm -hmm. certain things. So we had a meeting with a, a pollster. We, we do some of this too, but we were actually re working with this other pollster on something. And she's really like brilliant person. And she was talking and she just had gotten out of the field with some research on female candidates and how they're perceived on economic and finance issues. Yeah. It's not great. It's not great. I mean, the voters generally, especially men do not and things are shifting a little bit, but do not trust mm -hmm. women as much on the economy or financial issues as they do male candidates. Yeah. So even like figuring out how to defend against those things 
even though it's not a scandal, right? It's just the fact that yep. you had the luck of the draw that, you know, you are, you know, present as a woman and you're a woman, yeah. female candidate. That's, you know, not your fault. It, it just is who you are and you didn't do anything wrong. So like, there is a little bit of that too, but yeah, like working with people on how to frame their issues there. I mean, there are some times where you can turn it into a strength too. Like for mm -hmm. example, criminal justice issues are a big one where it's like when you're a kid, you make some bad decisions, you know, I don't know, maybe you got caught with like some marijuana when you were younger yeah. or something and, and you got thrown in prison for, you know, a couple years or juvie or something like that for, for a few years or months or whatever it is. And, you know, then you kind of look back and you say, well, really was, was it that bad? I mean, like on it, like you were arrested for one joint. So like, then we can say like, all right, let's talk about criminal justice reform because like, does that really make sense for our country then to be throwing people in prison for stuff like that? I mean, does that yeah. help? Does that set people on the wrong path? I think the answer is yeah. So I think like you can kind of talk about those things in, from a, a gen so it's about finding that story and that can be a part of the story is like embracing that. It's so fascinating because there's, I, like I said, there's parallels for sure. Like everybody has weaknesses and everybody has those parts of themselves that a lot of times we're aware that other people don't jive with it or, or don't see it as positively. Being a woman is a really good example of that. And I think finding the positive, if it's possible, is, is a really great strategy. I am loving this conversation. I'm going to ask this question in two different ways. If somebody is in politics and wants to learn more about how to do this and to learn more from you, where should they go? And then as an add-on, do you have any, perhaps, and it's okay if you don't, but do you have any more general suggestions for entrepreneurs who are building brands who aren't in the political world? Yeah, that, that's a that's a good question. So I, I think, you know, for for someone who is either in politics, or, you know, they're looking to get into politics, you know, talking to people who have been through this before, is very helpful. It's very instructive. I, I think there's an element of and this isn't so much with brand, but with with how you execute the the brand story, ultimately, or, or the personal narrative is when you're in the thick of it, it's very hard to see the battlefield. Like yeah. you're in the trenches and you just think the walls are kind of just closing in on you. You're taking, you know, incoming fire from all over the place. It's very hard to zoom out and just see, see the field. Having, having some experience or talking to someone who's been through it before, whether it's another, you know, candidate or a consultant who understands this space it, and, and knows how to tell that story in, in a non-reactive way. Like, you know, sometimes you take a, take a punch and that's fine. You don't necessarily have to hit back in that moment, right? There, there are more optimal, optimal ways to do it. So I would say like, that's the biggest thing is like being able to stay on that message, message discipline, brand discipline is very hard because it just feels like you're under siege in some campaigns. Others are much more, you know, much friendlier affairs, but the, uh, but some aren't right. And, and so it's hard to, again, stay on that message because you want to get dragged into like the other stuff. You're like, Oh, I got to respond to this. And it's like, no, 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 no. Just like focus on your story. Tell, tell people your story. That's what people are listening to. This is temporary. It's not, and sometimes it's not right. So then you have to assess. So I think experience. So that's where I would go. It, you know, if if you're if you're looking to get into that for entrepreneurs now, and, and it's very much the same thing, right? Because you're battling in in a space that's extraordinarily competitive in whatever service area you're in, whether you're a startup or or you know solopreneur or someone like that. We've worked with entrepreneurs too in in this space and developing personal brands. It's so I would say number one is authenticity is very important. One of the things that you learn very quickly in politics is there's this sense that you need to f just find the right message, like the right words to say, mm -hmm. you're going to win the campaign, you're going to win the conversation. Now, imagine that you're listening to me, right? And I'm not a credible messenger to you at all. Right? So I'm saying all of the right words, maybe you agree with like 90% of the things that I'm saying to you. But to you, I don't reflect anything that that's credible at all. That's a bigger problem than even finding the right words to say is being a credible messenger. So that's all to say it's like you cannot shoehorn one type of brand or approach or communication style onto someone where it's not at least somewhat natural for for that person. Now you can coach certain things and sharpen up certain aspects of a person's brand or presentation or the way that they execute the messaging. But you can't, you can't make someone 
different than they are, right? You can't make someone who's not naturally confrontational be like the tough candidate. Yeah. Like it has to be, it has to be authentic. Same thing with entrepreneurs, right? You cannot make yourself into something that you're not. Not everyone is, you know, super extra extroverted, right? So like me personally, I'm more of an introvert. Like I like to talk, I like these sorts of settings, but like, that's about it. And it's funny. And when <laughs> I'd rather speak to a room filled with five, 500 people than sometimes like, you know, work the work, the crowded room, right? Like one-on-one -on -one mm -hmm. sort of stuff. It's just like, I don't know what it is, but like, you couldn't sh like shoehorning me into that situation and being like, okay, like if this is what you have to do to be great, that's, that's a tough sell for me. And I think, you know, people, when your audience, like, even if it is a one-to-one -one conversation in, in a room, they can tell that it's just not natural for, for you. So, so I would say like, that's a huge thing is like, understand what your authentic sort of self is and then build out from there. Don't like build something and then try to like squeeze yourself into it. Cause it's just not going to work. It's, it's, it, it, you need to be a credible messenger. I, I think is, is one of the biggest, biggest pieces I, I would walk away. And then how you execute that. There are all sorts of different ways to do it. I mean, there are different strategies, different framing, different um, emotional approaches to, to catch uh, capturing attention at that point. But I would say like, start with authenticity, start with credibility. You are speaking my language, Matt. We talk about this all of the time. I feel like so many entrepreneurs get stuck in the trap of modeling what's already been successful instead of starting at that place of truth and building from there. So thank you for saying that in your way, because it landed in a whole new way for me. And I love that phrase of being a credible messenger. And I think that that is perhaps said more often in politics, but it's really important in entrepreneurship too. So thank you for for phrasing everything that way. Where can people find you online? Sure. I am on LinkedIn. And then we have a, a Facebook page, a Publitics Facebook page, which is which is my firm. That's where we're also on LinkedIn there. Taking a break from Twitter for now, but I think we'll we'll be showing up on some of the newer platforms that might be coming up. So we're always giving stuff a try. But I would say like LinkedIn is probably the best place to, to find me right now. That's fantastic. Thank you so much for sharing your time and your wisdom. I learned so much in this conversation. And I know everybody that is listening did as well. I really appreciate it. Thank you. I enjoyed it. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of the Brand Gravity Show. I was fascinated. That entire conversation, I may have used that word too often. I hope you enjoyed the conversation as much as I did. I would love to hear your thoughts in the comments or reach out on either LinkedIn or Instagram and let's continue the conversation there.